good day. Welcome to the Corey Morgan Show. We're on winter number five this year, I think it is. If you're in the western prairies, you're getting yet another dump of snow, cold, miserable weather. It, it, it's funny, though, watching legacy media outlets. You know, CTV is the worst of the bunch. I mean, they're brutal. And uh, just a, a couple of weeks ago when it was warm, they already came up with their summer weather map. You know, they like having that map where it shows like a screaming, flaming red everywhere where it's like 18 or 19 degrees Celsius and trying to show how terrible the global warming is and reporting like crazy, of course, on the drought and the dryness. And we're going to see rattlesnakes in Edmonton and who knows what else if this carries on. But now, now, well, it's gone cold and wet. It's going to go green and the dugouts are filling up and the snowpack is doing well. So the, the, the water shortage might not happen. So what are they on to now? Well, this is their headline saying, wet weather to plague provinces. Yes, apparently we were all in a crisis because things were too dry, but as soon as it gets a little too wet, now it's a plague. It's a plague of wetness. Terrible. It's just, they, they thrive on weather hysteria, you know? It's, it's, it's snowing at the start of May in Alberta. Anybody who's tried to schedule a camping trip on a May long weekend knows that's pretty much par for the course. But uh, we still, the media has to make everything out to be a crisis, a weather event, a, a terrible climate change thing. Good to see you all checking in there, guys. Jordan Paradoxy, Mr. Stanley, lots of folks. Yes, use the comment scroll. Doug there, uh, send those things out. Get the questions my way, comments my way, send them my guests' way. My guest today is going to be Shane Wenzel. He's been on before. He's written columns for us and some other publications. And, of course, he is the, the head of Shane Holmes. Because, again, housing, homes, they're top of uh, the list for items these days on the news and city councils, things like that, especially in Calgary, but it's going on everywhere. Let's talk to somebody who actually builds the things, get a better idea of what's going on. How are we going to deal with this? Because there is a shortage of homes. There's no doubt about that. Just what everybody's fighting about now is how we're going to deal with it. So, I mean, and this is a bit related. And I'm going to talk about that. So, I mean, economic times, they've been tough since governments around the world decided to overreact and go bananas over COVID-19 in 2020. It's, uh, they shut down aspects of the economy and they increased government deficit spending. It was a recipe for mass inflation. So the outcome was as expected. And of course, we had supply chain shortages that led to runs on com consumer products while a currency creation of countries around the world shot prices through the roof. It's going to take at least a decade before we see stable economic activity again. Now, today in Canada, we're suffering from a housing shortage. And it wasn't just COVID policies that led to this, so it contributed. The pandemic was just the final economic straw on an issue that's building, building for a long time. We have had environmental regulations, gatekeeping local governments. They've been hindering housing starts as they have this obsessive focus on building up rather than out, and they've stunted natural urban growth. And of course, mass immigration has led to a huge increase in demand for housing as over a million people a year flow into the country. But let's say, let's say Canada figures it all out and we're ready to get building. Immigration, let's imagine, has been greatly reduced and is targeted. City councils have stopped nasal gaining about rezoning, uh, nasal gazing, and nasal, nasal gazing. That's a tongue twister, isn't it? But rezoning areas and began working on finding real ways to increase housing. And the government somehow even managed to balance the budget and get inflation under control. I know, a big imaginary world. We'd still be left with a massive housing backlog to catch up on. So the next question is going to be, who's going to build all these houses? Well, in 2023 in Calgary. There were 30,500 job vacancies. That's a lot of jobs, you know, vacant. And nearly 7,600 of them were in construction. And this trend is the same in every jurisdiction experiencing population growth. While activists and politicians ramble about raising minimum wages and finding ways to offer relief to baristas trying to pay off student loans, they don't speak up much on the bidding wars that are happening in the construction market for labor right now. Young people should be directed where the work is, rather than trying to create markets where they don't exist. We don't need more liberal arts graduates. We need tradespeople. There's been a stigma attached to the trades for decades. And when I finished high school, I saw it myself. I finished school in the, in the late 80s. I didn't have any idea what an apprentice was, even though I was finishing high school. Do they not even treat, teach you a little bit about that? How do you even start in the trades if I'm interested? But we were taught that your future is binary. Either you graduate high school and go on to pursue a degree, or you're a janitor. There was nothing in between. Kids who underperformed academically, well, they might end up sent to a dreaded vocational school, and they were considered objects of pity or shame. The young folks who found themselves training for the trades, though, despite the lack of guidance from the educational system, usually did pretty well for themselves. Instead of building up a debt of student loans, they went straight to the working world, and if they got certified in a trade, well, they were pretty much set. I mean, have you seen any plumbers in the unemployment line lately? Seen any electricians riding the bus to work? 
Heard any carpenters complaining of being underemployed? Journeymen in the trades are commanding high wages and good working conditions these days. There have been ups and downs in the economy, but they've typically been always working and they're enjoying the benefits of hyper demand for their skills today. Can the same be said for people holding a degree in interpretive dance or philosophy? Usually the only thing you can say to those graduates is, yes, please use skim in my latte, thank you. Even if it isn't in a formal trade, there's many well-paying construction opportunities. Heavy equipment operators, framers, drywallers, painters, they're all commanding high wages right now. Even entry-level unskilled construction laborers are being offered over $20 an hour to start in Calgary right now. What's the pay scale for a person with a degree specializing in gender studies or intersectional sectional South American poetry these days? There's nothing wrong with any other job for that matter as well. And looking at the listings online, I see janitors, the ones I mentioned earlier, they can make $20 an hour and uh, who's to say they don't move on to develop a cleaning business and make a lot more. We've allowed elitism to take over our education system. A large number of teachers are embittered liberal arts graduates who enter the field in pursuit of good pay and a pension rather than a love of teaching. They still harbor a disdain for the world that forced them to work at Pizza Hut for years before admitting their tribal music degree wasn't going to pay their bills. While the students who went into the trades or went to the oil field, of course, were buying big trucks in their first homes. They pass that attitude down to the students as they stigmatize non-academic career paths, even if unconsciously. Canada's education system has failed to create the skilled people we need for today's demands, and we're all paying the price for that now. It'll take years before the students of today are ready to take on the labor needs of tomorrow, but there's no better time than now to start changing our paths. AI, that's the big game changer, and it's going to be eliminating a lot of jobs. It's foolish to direct students into fields vulnerable to AI replacement. But it's going to be a long time before a robot's able to unplug your toilet, especially after Taco Tuesday or wire a new lighting system into your house, or change the shingles. Let's start preparing kids for career futures that are going to be in demand. And that means dropping the stigma applied to non-academic paths, and in particular, in construction and trades. All right, enough pissing and moaning out of me. Let's see what's going on out there in the rest of the news world with our news editor, Dave Naylor. If he's out there, here he comes. Hey, Dave, how's it going? Hey, Corey, how you doing? Yeah, pretty good. You know what I'm thinking? If I, was a, if I had to become a plumber, I'd be retired by now. Oh, yeah. Like I said, you, know, you don't see them driving old beaters like we have and things like that. They're doing pretty good. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, did you get much snow out of your Prittis compound? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Living in the foothills, there's a, a downside. Even uh, that close to Calgary, we get a hell of a lot of more snow out there. So uh, the bees are going to be crabby and buried for a week or so. Yeah, it was blizzarding down here a little while ago, but it seems to have stopped. Hey, you know, the big news the big news this week was the... Uh, the announcement uh, by Premier Smith on the uh, sort of look look see into high ra- high speed rail and other stuff uh, in the province. Just reading your tweets, Corey, I'm not quite sure. I could, couldn't quite get where you stand on the situation. You yeah. are only really concise. I've been trying to be nuanced about it and everything. Uh, <laughs> it's it's stupid. It's just stupid. I'm sick of this coming up every few years. Yeah, absolutely. We're not, uh, we don't have the population to support it, that's for sure. Uh, but anyways, on to the news because it's a busy day and uh, I got more stuff coming up. Uh, right now, the website is being led off with an utterly brilliant, brilliant column. I must say it's one of the best uh, uh, Nigel section has, has pr- presented in a while uh, on a time to give, uh, give permanent residents the right to vote. Uh, City Council in Calgary last night uh, approved a motion by nine to six that they were going to look at uh, advocating uh, getting permanent residents the right to vote. And uh, and I uh, I say that's a very good idea, uh, even though, of course, you uh, were against it, Corey, uh, uh, as you uh, as you are. Uh, national debt ceiling, uh, we found out today, is now being raised to $2.1 trillion uh, by our finance minister, Freeland. Uh, that is an awful lot of zeros, uh, as you can see there. But it was a historic day today, Corey, and the, finally the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion uh, is uh, is open and, and flowing. Uh, we've got our own uh, Paul Forseth with a column on uh, how it wasn't really Trudeau's uh, uh, success, uh, despite the fact I'm sure he'll probably claim it. And uh, we've got our energy reporter, Sean Polzer, sort of looking at the ins and outs of uh, uh, how it uh, how it finally uh, came to be and finally got uh, final approval by the Canadian Energy uh, Regulator uh, uh, last night. Uh, Corey, I've got a story just about to publish that I know is going to anger you. Uh, Edmonton uh, NDP MP Heather McPherson has introduced a private member's bill in the House of Commons 
that will block Alberta leaving the Canadian pension plan. Uh, so that's going to uh, anger anger a lot of uh, uh, a lot of our readers too, Corey, because I think there's uh, some support for it out there. Well, uh, hopefully it angers a lot of Edmonton voters, and this will be her last bloody term in their uh, will. We'll wait and see. Uh, the Trans Mountain, though, did, did Sean also cover? Because I, I saw, I, I put myself through watching the NDP leadership debate in Alberta last week, and our blessed Nahed Ninchi, the, the savior of the NDP, he took credit for getting the Trans Mountain built. I, I, I don't know if he's been getting that credit elsewhere, but he actually said that during the debate. I, I don't know if Sean uh, caught that part or not. Well, you know, Sean is an energy expert, and he's, a, he's also a pipeline expert. Uh, but in his story today, there is no mention of Nahid Nenshi. So ah. I, will demonstra- I will remonstrate with him for missing that key fact. Okay, well, we'll, we'll look further into it. I'm sure uh, Mr. Nenshi's fingerprints are somewhere in that thing. I'm sure they are. All right, thanks for the update, Dave, and we'll uh, talk to you after the show. Thanks, Corey. And yeah, I, I wish I was kidding. You know, the, the, this Trans Mountain Pipeline, I mean, has been a debacle since day one. It could have been built by private enterprise. It was there. All we needed was for the government to get out of the way. Kinder Morgan wasn't first threatening, saying we're just going to walk out and close the door on this. They were saying, please, stop these endless court challenges. Stop this ridiculous pile of regulations. Make this secure. We want to build this pipeline. But Prime Minister Pinhead wouldn't do that. The, The government of B.C. wouldn't do that. All they did was throw up more and more roadblocks. So like any good business people, Kinder Morgan said, well, fine, we're gone. And they pushed it too far. It, it, it puts lie to a lot of that myth that a lot of governments think, particularly when it comes to energy companies, they think they're never going to leave. They love that oil and gas is there, so they're not going to leave no matter what we do to them. You know, Pierre proved that wrong when he drove them all out of Alberta back in the, with the National Energy Program. Our own premier, Stelmac, proved that wrong when he raised the royalty rates and energy companies moved their rigs south of the border. And Justin Trudeau figured out that lesson all over again when he drove Kinder Morgan out. And because we were really hooped, even liberal economists realizing we need to get that product to market, they were forced to jump in and buy the thing. And look at it. Look at the disaster. Four years too late. Again, better late than never. I'm happy this thing's flowing. I really am. We need to move that product. But, and, and, and the budget, when we're talking, you know, it was started at $4.5 billion when private enterprise was looking to do it. So far, they're looking at, and we'll, I'm sure these numbers will get adjusted, $35 billion. That's insane. It's insane. Taxpayers got stuck on the hook, and they never would have had to spend a nickel if the government just would get out of the way. So yeah, he gets labeled as wacko Trudeau. I don't know, some of the, the parliamentary stuff going on. And hey, I love using my, my nasty language. I just called Trudeau a pinhead. Fair enough. But I'm a host on a show. I'm a personality on Twitter. I'm not sure if it's that great for Polyev to get in there and jump on the wacko game. I love watching it, I got to admit. And I certainly don't feel much empathy for Trudeau. But I don't know. Question periods are a gong show as it is. I, I don't know if it contributes. I don't know if it harms either. It's not like anything productive really comes out of question period at the best of times, even if they're being civil to each other. You ask Trudeau something politely, you get a word salad. You ask him something difficult, he runs out the door and you get a junior minister responding who will give you another word salad. So I guess out of frustration, you, you might as well just start calling him names because uh, it's just not uh, going anywhere. It's political theater. And uh, Jay Bortnick, one of our commenters there, says, you know, people like to look at a gong show. That's true. That's part of it, I guess. I mean, part of the whole scene was, well, it made the headlines, right? Uh, we, we saw more of the clash between the conservatives and the liberals, and it's in the news today. I guess it's just questionable as to whether or not it's a, a productive way to get in the news or not. Sometimes, you know, leave the name calling to me, guys. I got it covered. I'm good at it. All right, let's get on to more serious talk. And, and, and it's something that's been dragging on and going on, well, in Canada but in Calgary particularly lately, and that's why I wanted to reach out to him, uh, Shane Wenzel from from Shane Holmes, because of course we're we're talking now in Calgary, it's been a big deal for people who are watching from from out of province or out of the city. It's been a week and some of hearings over blanket rezoning, and they're framing it that the the way housing prices are gonna be brought to affordability is if we just apply zoning, rezoning all the way across the entire city in a blanket manner, and a lot of people don't agree with that, and they've been speaking up, but uh, it sounds like it's going to go ahead. Anyways, I want to talk to somebody who actually builds the things, not a bunch of uh, uh, busybodies uh, on city council who uh, managed to find their ways into those seats. Uh, I'm not sure how. So uh, welcome back to the show, Shane. I really appreciate you coming on to talk to us today. Well, thanks for having me, Corey. 
So I, I, I want to start with this zoning. I mean, I, I, I've said before, I said when I first messaged you, I'm a little mixed, though. There's some areas where there could be some room to change some zoning or not. I know you might, you know, maybe people might not be happy if it's their house that's the one next to the new fourplex or things like that. But this whole mess, I mean, it's, it's they're going in a blanket way and they're talking as if it's a panacea. Uh, would rezoning change, I guess, your ability to, to build a lot more homes to, to try and fill the need right now? No, it wouldn't. It, it, it wouldn't fill a gap anywhere, Corey. <laughs> the unfortunate part is, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm of your opinion as well, is that, you know, the funds have, uh, have already been accepted by city council. So this is just pandering to the, uh, to the masses at this point. And it's sad. It really is because, you know, they have a process in place already that, uh, you know, with the LAP process where they can at least take a look at, uh, at it area by area and designate zoning around higher traffic or, uh, or uh, you know, public transit corridors where I think people would be perfectly fine with, with uh, having that kind of density around them. But, you know, for some reason we need to blanket rezone an entire city. And I think that just creates nothing but a mess as we're seeing by the, uh, the number of days it's taking for, uh, for people to get through their panels. Well, yeah, we've never quite seen anything like this. I mean, there's always been means and accommodation for people to come into public hearings. Our own sin, I guess, is as citizens, we rarely go out to anything at City Hall. We don't pay much attention to them. But something happened this time. I mean, 800 and some people signed up to, to speak out. Uh, I, I don't think it's all just selfish homeowners, is it? No, it isn't selfish homeowners. Uh, yeah, I mean, again... Uh, most people will purchase their home and uh, they look at it as their nest egg at the, uh, at the end of their uh, career, at the end of their life. <clears throat> and if they can't maintain that, I think that's where the large, a lot of the largest concern comes in. But you also have concerns with, uh, you know, with parking availability, traffic uh, in the community. And, uh, and, uh, and of course, you know, short-term rentals is, is another uh, bit of the topic as well. Yeah, so I think people just want to protect the privacy that they have, but they want to protect the fabric of their neighborhood as much as they can as well. So you're in business and, of course, the, the housing business. We need more homes. That's something almost everybody agrees on. We need more. Sure. Uh, how best, I mean, just even in your own business interest, you want to build them as fast and as plentifully, you know, and, and, and in a decent quality as possible but what do you need to be able to do that then as, as quickly and reasonably as possible? Like what's a real solution? Even I know there's no overnight one, but uh, how can we move towards that? Uh, and that's the unfortunate part, Corey, this is not a short-term fix. Uh, this has been building up for a number of years, but uh, you know, if I had to start at the top level with the federal government, uh, get the hell out of the business. <laughs> you know, I mean, they've created a, a, a tremendous amount of red tape over the years, but uh, you know, between all levels of government, uh, you know, and it depends on what municipality you live in. I mean, roughly 30% of the cost of a, uh, of a new home is, is related to the, to the red tape, to the, uh, the government fees. So, I mean, they've got to start abating that and, uh, and bringing it back in line rather than constantly going to the well. But I think you also have to, uh, to freeze immigration for a year or two. And, uh, and reset it back to normal levels because it's unsustainable the way it is right now. But at the same time, you know, why can we not focus on, uh, on bringing in skilled trades as, uh, or professional services as, as part of our immigration plan? I think that's, uh, that's one of the two of the best places to start. But uh, you know, again, continuing on with the federal level, when we talk about infrastructure funds, which is tied back to you know, everybody's favorite topic lately of the uh, blanket rezoning in Calgary. Stop it. Don't tie infrastructure to that. Uh, you know, quite honestly, the federal government should just set aside maybe five, six billion a year or for, uh, for infrastructure for the municipalities, you know, so they can actually build that and no strings attached. Or, you know, the simpler way is leave the municipalities with one or two percent more of, uh, of the taxes that they collect because this is where the problem's coming in. The municipalities just don't have the funds to keep up with the growth at times. Yeah, I mean, it is a challenge, even well-meaning municipalities. I mean, this growth is just changes every model and, and blows it out of the water. Mm -hmm. we, we've got an advantage in Calgary. I mean, I, I've looked at that, I've gone on about that a lot of times. You know, there's areas like Vancouver, you're pretty constrained just by being stuck in a valley with an ocean on one side, or exactly. Toronto, you're already built 
everything that's within, you know, uh, many, many miles of the center. But we have room to grow out, but instead we're demonizing it. And, and I look in the United States, uh, you know, the most affordable areas, even though they got good economies, you're looking at Houston and Austin, even though they're quite progressive or Phoenix, because they're letting people grow outward. I mean, it's not the end of the world to build good, decent density, new neighborhoods, is it? No, it's not. But I mean, the areas that you described would probably fit the definition of uh, urban sprawl, as the zealots like to uh, claim we have here in Calgary. And I've argued that for a number of years. When you build one subdivision after another after another, you actually don't have sprawl, especially when they're more dense than uh, than a lot of the neighborhoods within inner city Calgary. So, you know, if you could get the zealots out of the way and they could finally admit that uh, yeah, new suburbia actually fills a void for affordability, then yeah, you could uh, you could continue to make a dent in uh, in the housing shortage that we have here in Calgary. Yeah, and I mean. That, that's something there's a bit of a myth, I mean, with a lot of people. In uh, Walden, for example, I mean, way down in South Calgary, for people who don't know it, but it's a new district. But boy, mm-hmm. it's hard to find single-family dwellings in there. There's a, a lot of townhouses, there's condos, yeah. there's duplexes, and uh, why not? But it's a new area. It's technically sprawl, according to the Zealots. Well, yeah, but uh, what, what what they won't tell you is that uh, it's, uh, it's about a 60-40 split in favor of single family, or in some cases, a 50-50 split when you go out to new suburbia. You know, so they're much more dense uh, to the point where they're, on average, let's say about uh, 10 units per acre. Whereas if I went to Charleswood in Calgary, that would be about six units per acre. So have we not resolved the problem with density targets in new suburbia yet? Yeah, so... Let's see, though. Uh, part of the problem, as you said, we got multiple levels of pro- government. We got multiple levels of problems. Mm-hmm. Uh, my opening monologue was actually on how we aren't training up people in the trades or, or uh, you know, in, just in construction in general. And uh, but that's going to be years to solve, even if we work towards it. And as you pointed oh, yeah. out, we do have a lot of people who want to immigrate. Is there room for companies then, perhaps, to? work with government and try to target uh, labor coming in to fill the voids you need. Like that's the thing is governments, they try to fill the void for their political sake. You, you, you're looking more pragmatically. You, you want to bring in people that can help build these units. Do, do you think there's an appetite for that sort of dialogue? I think there's an appetite for that dialogue uh, and hopefully on every level, you know, what would, uh, what would really benefit us, uh, especially in this industry, uh, you know, uh, a couple of things. One, uh, if, uh, you know, federal, provincial uh, would uh, would invest in, you know, trade schools. Uh, and I'm not picking on what we have with uh, with Sater Nate right now, but uh, it doesn't take four to five years to, uh, to give, say, accreditation to a drywall or a painter, a framer, or a cider. They, uh, they need a four or five, six month course. And that's where a trade school can fill, the, fill a tremendous void. And, uh, and I think that would uh, also resolve a problem uh, with, uh, with immigration and just giving them their equivalency based on their skill set. So they're ready to go in Canada within months of, uh, of arriving. Um, I, I guess so. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of bounce around a little. You spoke on regulation. Okay. Uh, in Vancouver, I saw somebody put out a breakdown of a condo in Vancouver to build it you know, from ground to finish. It was just insane. I, I think it was yeah. like a, an $800,000 condo, but it would have like 350000 in just Junk is the way I'm going to put it. Junk permits, mm-hmm. applications. I mean, this is not value added stuff. This is just government on government on government. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the argument you get from people say, well, do you want to get rid of safety standards or fire standards and all that? And, and suddenly you go down that rabbit hole of, of uh, you know, putting people at risk. But I mean, which regulations can we just get rid of? Clearly, we can get rid of some. Yeah, I don't know if we're getting rid of anything, anything related to safety. That's the problem. Oh, oh that's just the yeah, argument. In mind, I mean, if we go back 30, 40 years, we didn't have those in place then, and we were still a, we were we were still building houses that didn't catch fire or fall fall to the ground. So I think I, I think the problem is Corey is, uh, you know, it's 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 that uh, thought or at least that attitude that you know it's only a thousand dollars. Well, you keep adding on a thousand dollars over forty years before you know it you're up forty thousand dollars on uh, on the units when you uh, when you buy them you know and, and that's not fair i don't think a lot of those regulations need to be as stringent or they need to be as high as they are right now because they've also contributed to where we are today so take them off i mean there's tax on tax on tax but uh 
you know, one of the things that's, uh, that's contributing to the problem is, uh, is the new national building code as an example. You know, it's like we're policymakers are trying to build a better mousetrap. And, you know, I think you can reach a plateau where, you know, it's good enough for a while and you don't have to touch it. <laughs> and maybe that's just an old attitude to have, or maybe it's just a better way of thinking. But, you know, when I take a look at the National Energy Code and it's, uh, it's pushing us towards net zero in new homes, from where we are today, that would be another $30,000 attached to the sale price of a home. Now, you want to amortize that over 25 years on a mortgage. That's damn near $60,000 that uh, the Canadians are paying out of their pocket just for their home. Is that necessary? Is it, is it really making a many, much more energy efficient? Or quite honestly, why don't we give people a, uh, you know, a tax break? Spend, you know, give them a $30,000 tax break to renovate their homes. You know, get rid of that old mid-efficient furnace that's not that mid-efficient anymore. That old hot water tank, those uh, old single pane windows. Improve the attic insulation in their home. And, uh, you know, if we're going after GHG targets in this country, you'd probably resolve that in about two to three years. You'd have a tremendous boom in the, uh, in the renovation uh, industry from about 8 billion a year to 15 billion a year. I think it's a win-win on everybody's side, but I think that's how you can resolve the energy side of it. But God, don't add in another code that adds more to the houses and really resolves nothing. Yeah, and that can help with the retrofitting. And I mean, some of it on your end, I mean, you're in a competitive industry. There's other builders trying to sell homes too. And, and a good selling sure. point to people on a new home is, hey, your electric bill is going to come down by this much or your heating bill. I mean, if if builders can build in more efficient or, or uh, cost-effective ways to, to have the house, they're, they're going to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, We're already there, Corey. It all comes down to how people live. If someone wants their temperature up at uh, 19 degrees in their home every day, it's probably going to be more efficient than somebody who has it up at 22 degrees every day. They're going to use less natural gas. The furnace isn't going to be firing as often. So it's, you know, <laughs> it's a great thought, but sometimes, you know, it almost goes too far and we're not resolving anything at this point, in my opinion. No, uh, we don't need to legislate it. Just leave people no. alone. They, they, they want to save money. Don't worry. They'll do it. <laughs> But, uh, well, I, I guess with this, this rezoning, it looks like, as we said, it's a done deal. They already know what they want to do. They're going to do it. They're, they're going through the motions right now. Uh, can that toothpaste be put back in the tube, though? I mean, we, we might change the council. It's certainly looking promising in a year and change, but mm -hmm. you know, a lot of gears will start turning by the time that happens. Uh, it, it, will this damage be able to be undone? I think the damage can be undone, but I definitely think this is now an election issue. Uh, and I think you'll have candidates running next fall uh, just based on that, is that we are going to reverse what this council uh, has put through. Well, and uh, it'll be, uh, I, I think at least, I mean, it, it depends. You get to confirmation bias in the social media circles I run with and so mm -hmm. on. But it looks to me like that'll be a difficult, the blanket zoning is going to be a difficult one to run on for those incumbents right now. I mean, part of it, too, is that, you know, homeowners are the ones who usually are the ones who donate to campaigns. They're usually the ones who go out to vote. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the activists who are screaming about uh, densification and such tend to be more transient renters. I don't want to blanket. I can speak of blanketing, but uh, everybody sure. out there. But uh, you've got a strong voting bloc who's going to be pretty upset with this. And I suspect they're going to want to see some change the next time around. I suspect that as well, Corey. But again, I think one of the fallacies that... Uh, you know, that, uh, that these groups are, are working with is that, you know, this infrastructure, th this money coming from the federal government is simply for infrastructure. It has nothing to do with affordability of homes, nothing. Uh, you could take and you could demolish a, uh, you know, a, a million dollar, you know, 1950s bungalow in the inner city, and you could stick four, maybe six townhome units on it. You're still not going to get it cheaper than I can build it out in uh, new suburbia. You know, so it's really not tackling that issue. And I guess that's why I end up on the opposite side of the fence at times is this is this money from federal is just going to infrastructure, period. It has nothing to do with bringing down the cost of housing. No, and uh, but they sure like having those big announcements. I mean, they don't want to go into nuts and bolts. They want to stand hand in hand with a mayor, with a member of parliament and say, sure. look at all this money we're putting in to help you. And anybody who opposes this is clearly a heartless person who 
just doesn't want affordable housing. It's political theater, and unfortunately, it's not serving anybody. No, unfortunately, it's not. It's just, you know. It's 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 a frustrating process to watch, and I've watched a number of uh, number of people make their presentations, and you can you can feel a lot of empathy for them. Uh, they're strongly strongly concerned, and uh, and I don't blame them. Well, I, I appreciate you know your your willingness to to speak out and be candid, you know, on these issues. I mean, we we see some backlash that comes, and it's come towards your family before, even for daring to speak, you know, on on these things and such. And but the business community shouldn't be afraid to speak up on issues like this. And like I said, I I appreciate you adding, you know, an experienced voice to this. So before I let you go, where can people find? I know you've been doing a lot of videos lately. Uh, you've written for a couple of publications. You're, you're getting pretty prolific uh, in between, you know, building all those houses. Yeah, yeah, I seem to find time to do all this, but it's uh, it's fun and uh, it's knowledge sharing. But uh, the easiest way to find me, I've kept it really simple, is just if you're on social media, look for at Shane Wenzel and you're going to find me on most platforms. Great. Well, I, I appreciate you coming on to talk to us again, Shane, and, and uh, the contributions you make to the Western Standard as well uh, when you're writing things. Uh, I know you are quite busy and uh, hopefully in the long run, if we keep pushing, common sense will prevail and uh, Maybe, you know, the next generation doesn't have to give up all hope on owning a home. I hope so as well, Corey. Thanks yeah. for having me on. Thanks, Shane. So, yes, that was Shane Wenzel. As he said, he's easy, as he said, it's very easy to find him. Just look up Shane Wenzel on social media. He's outspoken and prolific. And as you can see, offers good reasoned common sense. Not as a grumpy as I am on covering all those issues either. So, you know, if you get tired of my vitriol and so on, Shane can offer a nice controlled voice to talk about those things. But we need those discussions. We need discussions from people in the industry, people uh, looking at these things. I, I saw somebody asking the question, um, uh, it was paradoxy, about uh, the infrastructure co ability to cope with densification. And I think Shane and I talked a bit about that before too, because when you're talking about rebuilding established areas and inner city areas, people forget there's some very ancient in infrastructure underground in those areas. And it can be extremely costly to dig up and tap in and expand to try and, and manage. I mean, if we're just talking utilities even uh, in an area, when you're putting a lot more people into an area that was never originally designed to handle that many, when, when you're getting into the uh, outer areas of a city you can build to, to deal with, uh, you know, the growth that you're going to need in that area. Uh, see, see, there's some of the language, but fair enough. You know, it's a comment uh, based show. So I appreciate it. Papillon or Papillon says, uh, Oh, Shane Holmes, were they responsible for part of the soulless suburban sprawl? Well, yeah, Shane Holmes is one of the builders that builds new homes for people out there. Uh, and again, it's soulless suburban sprawl. What I call it is affordable new housing. You know, before I left Calgary for Pritis, and that's part of what's going on too, you see, is as they pressure things in the city, a lot of people, if they can, they flee. So they just move out of the city anyways. And uh, I used to live in Highland Park in Calgary, which is a, uh, it was a pretty well-developed older uh, urban area. And uh, a house behind us got, and we're talking, you know, 12, 14 years ago or something, got, got torn down, a good existing little bungalow, and they built a duplex there, a duplex, a huge though duplex, and those units, I think, were 650000 each year. Remember, back then, you could get a house, a full-out house in Calgary, especially in that area, probably for more like $300,000. So they took one $300,000 house out and uh, put two you know, $600,000 duplexes in. Who's getting more affordable housing out of that? I mean, if your goal is affordable housing, stuffing more people into those areas isn't doing it. It isn't bringing it about. Um, but we got a lot of, uh, again, the, the, the pitchforks are coming out, you know, I mean, so, I mean, one of the things going on is there's the, it's starting this month, the boycott Loblaws thing is going on. Yes. Yes. There's the big internet movement, the big Reddit movement saying boycott Loblaws because they've been gouging everybody on their groceries and we got to boycott them. It doesn't matter how many times, how many studies, how many inquiries come out out there. Loblaws isn't gouging anybody. You don't have to like them. You don't have to like Galen Weston. But they, it's a public company, and the numbers are there. Their profit margins are under 4%. That's it. They're not gouging. Grocery prices are going up. That's true. But it doesn't mean that Loblaws is the one making them go up. In fact, it's quite competitive, and that's with this boycott approval. For one, eh, it's just internet talk. Boycotts don't work. People are going to shop where it's most practical for them, where they get the better prices, typically. If you don't like Superstore... You can go to Walmart. Don't like Walmart, you can go to Safeway. Don't like Safeway, you can go to uh, Co-op. There's a number of options out there. 
And uh, Loblaws, ironically, with Superstore and London Dirks, tends to be often one of the cheapest of them. They don't have more room to come down. People say, oh, but look at the, the salary that Galen West is taking. Oh, he's worth billions. I don't care. I don't care. I'm sick to death of politics of envy. I couldn't give a rat's flying whatever how much Galen Weston's worth. You know what? If all those CEOs were down to 100000 a year in salary, do you know how much it would save you on your grocery bill? About a dollar a month, maybe two? That's not where it's happening. So let's look where the real issue is happening. And, uh, you know, so let, let's talk about bad policy, though. One of the areas, and it ties into the Trans Mountain finally being ready and, and coming up at, uh, you know, what, seven times over budget once government took over. And I was just appalled, almost not surprised, but appalled to see Premier Smith get up and start talking about high-speed rail in Alberta. This is an idea that there are train fetishes, uh, fetishists out there. That's really what they are. They, they got a thing for trains. They love trains. They think they're great. Good for you. You love those things, but it doesn't mean they're economically feasible. And they certainly aren't economically feasible everywhere. Premier Smith's always loved train sex. She even had a restaurant in a train car for a while. But this is reeking of a pet project. This got studied, I don't know, 12 years ago. We spent a bunch of money. We did a big study on it, study on it and we found that high-speed rail won't work in Alberta. It doesn't work. We would need... It felt, at that time, a population of about 10 million people. And uh, the ticket prices, again, if you're guessing on it, if it got built, might be in the range of $200 to get Calgary to Edmonton. It just doesn't work. People keep talking about, and I've been debating them online. I don't believe in blindly following things. You see, that's where people got so upset with me, because I was critiquing Daniel Smith. Well, I love a lot of what Premier Smith is doing. I've been very supportive of it, but this one's a stinker, guys. This is bad news. Do not start moving towards this. We studied it. They said it was crap. Leave it alone. But she won't. And when they, the, the way they were talking so gushingly and everything, they said, we're just studying it. No, they're starting the groundwork to move towards this. And I get other people saying, oh, but look at how it works in Japan. Look at how it works in France. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, let's look at that. Japan has, what, 120 million people in an area that's only a little bit bigger than half the size of Alberta. That's a rather big difference. We have... Four and some million, maybe getting more towards five? Not even close, guys. Meanwhile, France, same sort of thing. I think they have 60 million and far, far more dense. High-speed rail doesn't work for that. Think of it. What if building that between Calgary and Edmonton? Okay. And it, let's say it costs $10 billion. That means out of your pocket, right off the bat, and trust me, it'll cost more than that. Think of expropriating all the land required. Think of all of, of the battles that'll have to go on, the court challenges, the rest. So let's say you got that right of way going. Then you got the uh, stations built. You got all that done. You got that train in. And let's say it was even $10 billion. That means every man, woman, and child in Alberta will be shelling out about $2,000 each just to have it built. That's what the cost would come into. And of course, not everybody pays taxes. So realistically, if you're a middle-class taxpayer, it's more like you're going to be shouldering about $3,000 of that. And then... You're going to have to pay a couple hundred to ride this thing. Maybe, or it'll be subsidized down. So you'll pay all the time whether you ride it or not, and then get a relatively cheaper ticket. We don't need this. It's ridiculous. Get on and people say, Highway 2 is so crowded and nasty. Yes, it is. So expand it. Look at the vehicles on Highway 2 in Alberta. Not all of them are going all the way from Calgary to Edmonton. Some of them are going Calgary to Panoka. Some of them are going Panoka to Westlock, you know, and, and past Edmonton, things like that. And they're people with vehicles, they're people with families, they're people with luggage. Do you really want to go through, okay, I'm going to go from Calgary to uh, Edmonton to visit Aunt Edna there, and I'll take the two kids. So let's say it's a family of four. Okay, we're going to take an Uber and pay that price, or we'll drive to this train station and pay for parking. You know, check in, check our luggage, spend $100 a head. So it's $400 one way to get the family up there without including the Uber and parking costs. And you get to the other side in Edmonton, maybe half an hour earlier than you would have if you just bloody drove, even if it's a high-speed train, because you had to stop in Red Deer. And then, uh, then you got to get an Uber, get in that, and go all the way to Aunt Hedna's, and then you're stuck without a vehicle for your visit. And, you know, and you got to listen to her interminable stories about her bad hip and things. And you can't even make an excuse saying, I'm going to hop in the car and go to the liquor store because you took the train. Look, guys, it's going to be a very limited market. 
And then I've had others talk about, look at Via Rail in Canada. It's a catastrophe. It's heavily, heavily subsidized and, and it's terrible service. And then there's other people saying, well, that's because they, they have to share the tracks with CP and they don't get priority routing and things like that. Well, okay. Uh, but then when we want to start talking about costs, when you're talking about, see, the, the, some people are saying, well, we would just do Banff to uh, Calgary on a conventional rail. Oh, okay. Well, then you got to share the track. So it'll have the same problem as VIA. So you're dealing with CP because they own that track. Or, or you build another track. And again, for people not familiar with Alberta, Drive between Calgary and Banff. What have you got going on there? For one, there's a whole bunch of mountains you're going to have to blast once you get into the uh, canmore Exshaw region to, to get that track uh, in there. The other part is you're going through the Stony Reserve. Yes, a great big First Nation. You have to get through, and it's their land, and they have every right to negotiate the best deal they can. And again, if you're familiar with Calgary, we had a ring road that went through the Sutina Reserve. It took 40 years to negotiate that. 40 years. And cost billions. And that's just a chunk of ring road. How much do you think the Stoney is going to want to have a railroad track doubled through their reserve? It ain't going to come cheap. Look, we don't want to rule out other areas of transportation. We could talk about extending the LRT in Calgary. It's not a real long shot anymore from the Northeast to get it to the airport, perhaps. And people have talked about, well, what about to Cochrane? Well, again, it's already moving up that way up Crowchild. Keep creeping it up that way if you've got the demand, and eventually you will have train transit going those ways. But look in Calgary as well. we got the green line they're talking about, the green line. We've been talking about it for years. And they've been ripping up downtown Calgary, doing utility work and crap on it for years. And it keeps, you know, they, they won't make the budget bigger, which is five and some billion, but what they keep doing is making the green line smaller. So, I mean, eventually this thing's only going to be one station at the rate they're going. And uh, taxpayers are on the hook. We've got to remember the world's changing too. Part of the problem with the green line, people don't work downtown like they used to. The office buildings in Calgary are still nearly empty all over the place. we got 30% vacancy going on down here. we got another boondoggle going on uh, that showed with Gondek a little while ago where they were converting uh, an old uh, office building into residential units. And it turns out that the contractors aren't getting paid now and it's getting stalled and there's a big problem. And of course, the taxpayers are pumping millions into that as well. Guys, people don't need to live downtown anymore. We haven't had to since the fax machine. That was kind of the beginning of the end. You don't see the bike couriers running around with maps and documents from oil company building to oil company building. In fact, a lot of people, that's one thing COVID changed all around was people realizing, I don't have to be down there all the time. I can work from home. I can do a whole bunch of the stuff that I did at downtown on a laptop or on a computer in my house. And they're doing that. Maybe not full-time, but part-time. So why are we building more infrastructure to suck everybody into a centralized city? The reality is we're growing out. Let's build to accommodate that. Let's get realistic. Let's look at it. Here's where, okay, to be fair, where some of the right can go a little wild at times. Let's look at complete communities, I think is the term they often use. You know, a new development that'll be on the outside of a city, but it's higher density, and it also has a lot of the services built in for that, because that way people don't have to commute into the center. So make sure there's a school there, a medical facility there, uh, retail space there, all of those things, so they don't have to move as far. Good stuff. It's just good planning, and it could sell. But we got to go out, not in, not up. I, yeah, again, the people, if you care about affordable housing... High density stinks. Look to every high density city in North America. It's easy. It's, it's great. You can study these things online. Look at the heavyweight high density cities. Look at Manhattan. Look at uh, uh, San Francisco. Look at look at uh, uh, Seattle. High density. Also expensive as all hell for renters and homeowners. Isn't that kind of contrary? But they've built up. Yes, but it doesn't matter. Because the areas where you can get affordable is where you build out. You want to be affordable? Las Vegas, Phoenix, Houston, even Tennessee is getting really good out there. You know, these areas where they're not fixated on this anti-suburban uh, lunacy. They're just letting people build where they want to go. Let people choose where they want to go. Um, it's, it's, they will go there, <laughs> but you got to get out of the way. It gets back to that Trans Mountain thing too, right? This is an area, and that's what Shane kept talking about as well. A lot of just, just get out of the way. Consumers will choose what's right. They'll choose what works best. They'll choose fuel-efficient green homes. Why? Maybe not because ideologically they want to save the world and become the next Greta Thunberg. It could be just because they want to save some money on the heating bill, which is a good motivation. 
and they'll save money on electric or whatever it is, hot water. They will do the upgrades. They will buy the houses that save the money on these things. If a solar panel on a new house helps uh, reduce some of your costs for water heating or supplements your energy a little, great. If it works for you, go for it. Don't have the government mandate it, though. That's the problem. And governments are all capable of bad, stupid ideas. So I got to close on that. It's important to hold even, in, in fact, especially the governments you like, the politicians you like, the ones you typically support, you have to speak up and hold them responsible when they drift. We'll always yell at Trudeau. We'll always yell at Notley and Nenshi and the rest. But don't forget to yell at Smith when she messes up too. Not yell at, but at least just say, hey, 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 this is the wrong path. Hold on, course correction. You're supposed to be here for small government, not building giant infrastructure, boondoggle white elephants, which is what a, a high-speed rail will be. It will be. And she shouldn't even, she's got a, a hundred irons in the fire already. Why she took off on this deviation into rail lines, you got a lot more to deal with already. Either way, that's the time and ranting I got today, guys. And I, hey, it's been interesting watching some of you guys debating in the in the comments zone. I like seeing that. I appreciate it. Uh, one more time, I remind you by the end, I forgot that earlier. I usually do it at the news check-in. Take out a subscription, westernstandard.news slash subscription. Become a member. It's $9.99 a month. That's what funds us. That's how we get by. That's how the government stays out of us over here. And if you've already subscribed, we appreciate it. So thank you very much for tuning in today, guys. Uh, tune in next week. We'll have another good show on the go. And, uh, well, I'll rant at you then. Thanks. <laughs>